So I saw a YouTube short the other day talking about this. It's a retention frame for the AM5 socket that replaces the factory frame and it's marketed to reduce temperatures in the seventh generation Ryzen CPUs. But does it work? I don't know. Let's find out. Stay tuned. So if you watched the build of the system right here a few weeks ago, you'll remember that I complained that the stock cooler that comes with the 7600 is just barely enough to keep the CPU cool. Now, my choice to go with the 7600 instead of the 7600X was based on the fact that the 7600 came with a stock cooler and we were trying to stay on a budget, but it turned out that the 7600 pretty consistently ran about 85C with the stock cooler. It turns out that is due to the boost algorithm in the seventh generation Ryzen CPUs and not so much the cooler, but we'll get into that in a little bit. But in my research to try to cool this thing down, I thought maybe this could help. So we're gonna try it out and then we're gonna talk about why the seventh generation Ryzen's run so hot to begin with. But first, I gotta pay some bills. So check out today's sponsor. Is your copy of Windows 10 unactivated? Well, it doesn't have to be because with today's sponsor, VIP SCD Key, you can get a valid Windows 10 license for under $20. Stop dealing with that stupid watermark on the desktop, the valid license for Windows 10. Also, with an activated copy of Windows 10, you can upgrade to Windows 11 for free. Just go to the link in the description below and pick up a valid Windows 10 license key. During checkout, use the code CYBERCPU for a 25% discount. Once you have your key, go to your activation settings in Windows 10 and click on the link that says Change Product Key. Enter the product key you just purchased and hit Activate. Now you don't have to deal with that stupid watermark that come with running an unactivated copy of Windows 10. Now, on with the video. So I want to do a quick public service announcement really quick before we get into the video. And on the video where we build this system, there's a bunch of scammers, I guess, that are claiming that I'm giving this system away. And unfortunately, I'm not. I'd love to, but if you guys watch the video, you'll know that I plan to gut this thing and make it my new system. So I can't really do that if I'm giving it away. Unfortunately, it looks like the scammers didn't actually watch the video. So... It's, it is what it is. However, if for whatever reason someone contacts you in the comments saying I'm giving a computer away for free, they're lying and they're trying to steal your money. So just let me know about it. Either leave me a comment on Twitter or say something in the comments of the video. Or you could also report it as well. It would be helpful. But anyway, let's get on with the video. So why do the Zen 5 Ryzen's run so hot? Your first thought would be that the tiny cooler that it comes with just isn't enough to keep it cool. I mean, that's what I thought. But the truth is the cooler is not as much as fault as you might think. The Ryzen 5 7600 that we built in the system is around a 65 watt processor. So the stock cooler should be able to keep it cool. And believe it or not, 85C is exactly where AMD intended it to run at. So that little stock cooler is in fact doing its job. The reason 85C is important is because on the Ryzen 7th gen processors, 85C is TJ Maxx, which is just a fancy way of saying the maximum thermal junction. It's the temperature threshold in which the CPU is allowed to hit in its boost algorithm. So until the CPU hits that magic temperature threshold, it's allowed to boost to its maximum boost clock, which for the 7600 is 5.1 gigahertz. So with this in mind, increasing your cooling capacity isn't necessarily going to drop the processor's temperature. I mean, it's just going to give the processor more headroom to boost, which is exactly why we wanna increase the cooling capacity in the first place. So with that out of the way, how is this little thing here going to help us with that? Well, the concept is based on the Intel LGA 1700. These processors run hot. And one of the reasons why is because of the socket design. In fact, it's because of the way LGA sockets work in the first place. The AM4 socket was a PGA socket. PGA stands for pin grid array. All the pins were in the CPU itself and they made it up with the socket, which was held down by the socket clamping down on all the pins on the CPU. So the CPU was seated properly into the socket by essentially retaining 
all of the pins across the entire surface of the processor, at least the underside of the processor. Now the AM5 and the LGA1700 use an LGA socket, which stands for land grid array. On these sockets, the pins themselves are on the socket and they are retained through a retention bracket that just barely touches the edges of the processor to hold it down. As you can see from this picture here, the LGA1700 and this one here of the AM5, the retention bracket only comes in contact with the CPU on those little wings on the left and right hand side of the retention bracket. So essentially what was happening to the LGA1700 chips was because they were so long and the retention bracket only held the left and right hand side of the chip, excessive temperatures would cause the IHS to actually warp and lose full contact with the cooler. Now, this seems counterintuitive because you also have the cooler itself pushing down on the CPU. But even with that force, the IHS on the Intel chips warps causing excessive temperatures. So the solution to that was a retention frame similar to this one that applies pressure all the way around the surface of the processor, stopping the IHS from warping and it significantly reduces temperatures. So does the same concept apply to AM5? I mean, AM5 uses a similar socket and is retained exactly the same as the Intel socket, but in reality, it's actually not the same. You see, the reason why the LGA1700 benefits from a retention frame is because of the size of the chip itself. It's a giant rectangle. The Ryzen chip isn't. It's a traditional square and technically, even though it uses the same retention method, the overall percentage of the IHS being held down is much larger than the Intel socket. And ironically, if we put these pictures back up here, you can see that the wings on the AM5 socket are also much larger than the wings on the LGA1700. So not only is the AM5 a smaller chip, but it has larger retention wings. But they still make an AM5 retention frame and it's only 15 bucks. So I think it's worth at least testing it to see if it makes a difference. So let's get this thing installed and see what benefit it gives us. So first, let's take a look at what this thing comes with. Obviously, you get the contact frame itself. And if you go into the box here, it comes with some thermal grease as well as all the screws that you need to install it. Now, these screws are kind of important, so don't lose them. They're extremely specific for this, and they're exactly the same size as the screws that hold down the original contact frame or the original frame mechanism that comes on the AM5 socket. So you should use the same tool in order to remove it. Now, it does come with a tool. It comes with an Allen key. However, I highly recommend you get yourself a T20 Torx driver because it will make the whole process a whole lot easier. So let's get this thing actually installed in the system. And to start with, we're gonna go ahead and take the side panel off, move some of this stuff out of our way so we can set the computer itself down. Now, depending on your system, you don't necessarily have to pull the GPU or anything out. I'm not going to on this one. I'm just going to pull it apart the way that it is. To start out with, all we're going to do is we're going to take the CPU cooler and the original frame out and then replace it with the new one and then repaste the CPU while we're doing it. So to do that, we're just going to go ahead and unplug it. We're going to take the screws from the cooler itself off. And then when you take these off, I would recommend loosening, the, loosening these a little bit at a time. Don't just loosen them all at once turn three or four turns on each screw so you can kind of take the cooler off evenly across the entire surface. If you, if you pull it off, you don't want it to pop uneven because you could put some uneven pressure onto the CPU socket itself and it could cause damage. It probably won't, but it's still good practice to do it this way. This is the way that I've always done it. So if anything else, it's just kind of habit at this point. So once we get it off, we can see that we have heat sink compound on it now. And what we're gonna need to do is go ahead and clean the heat sink compound off. Get yourself a nice rag to clean this off with. I have one that I use for compound. As you can see, it's been used for compound a couple of times. <laughs> and 
it's a good idea to have a somewhat clean rag because you don't want to actually transfer compound from your rag to the CPU. And I change mine out every once in a while, but it is nice to have a clean one. And then as you can see, the Gen 5 CPUs are kind of hard to get heat sink compound off of because of all their little machined edges and stuff like that, but it's not too bad. So once you get this cleaned up, the next thing that you want to do is go ahead and pull the old bracket, at least open the old bracket up. I wouldn't unscrew the old bracket with it tightened down onto the CPU. I would loosen it all up first. And then you essentially just unloosen these screws. Now the original bracket itself are captive screws. So you'll have to loosen them all first and then take them all out, if that makes any sense. It, they're captive, so they won't actually allow you to completely loosen each one while the rest of them are tight, if that makes sense. But once you loosen it up, you should be able just to lift up and out the old contact bracket, just like that. And like I said, these screws are captive, so they don't fall out. So you can go ahead and close this bracket up just like this, and then save it for if you ever wanna put it back into the machine. So to put the new one on, you just take it and set it over the top of where the old one came off. And you do that just like this. You just set it down right over the CPU, being careful not to move the CPU out of the socket because you really don't want to bend pins on an LGA socket. It's not a great idea. And then with the new screws, just go ahead and drop the new screws into the holes. At least this is how I do it. And believe me, I've had this thing installed and uninstalled several times during the testing of this to see how well it works. And essentially what I'll do is set all the screws in first and then tighten them all down individually. With all along, you wanna make sure that you don't let the CPU slip out of the socket. And these things don't have to be like ridiculously tight. Just snug is fine. And at this point, I'm gonna wipe it down real quick again, just to make sure there's no more compound on it. And I'm gonna use the compound that comes with it, but typically I use Thermal Grizzly, but this is here and it's free, so we might as well use it. So I'm gonna put some compound on this. Now, people watching this, you might say, well, I'm not doing it right, but you do it the way you wanna do it and I'm gonna do it the way I wanna do it. And then once you get the compound on, just go ahead and lower the CPU cooler back into place, making sure you line up all the screws. And then just like the way you removed it, I would tighten it a few screws at a time. I usually go three and go in a rotating pattern around the cooler. All right, once you get it screwed down, go ahead and replace the wire for the CPU cooler. And there you go. So my first comment that I have on this retention frame is it definitely looks a lot cooler than the stock AM5 frame retention system. You know, it does look good. And if it wasn't for the fact that the thing is going to be completely covered by your CPU cooler, and it would be worth the 15 bucks just for the looks alone. However, once you put your cooler on, it's practically invisible. So it better perform as good as it looks. So my first impression after doing all the testing was that this thing is not even worth $15. However, once digging through the data a little bit, my opinion kind of changed. Now keep in mind, all of this testing was done with the stock AMD cooler. So any benefit that we see is going to be hindered by the stock cooler capacity. So as you can see here, there's a temperature graph that I plotted through the entire run of Cinebench R23. And aside from a little temperature variation at the beginning and the end of the run, it didn't affect the temperature at all. In fact, it was the same across the board. In fact, the average temperature with the stock retention system, just this little silver one right here, was 82.4 C. And with the secure frame retention bracket, we got an average temperature of 82.5 C. And keep in mind that these numbers were also rounded, so the temperature variation was a little less than 0.1%. So that's it, case closed. This thing is a piece of junk and not worth your money. But wait. Isn't there another thing that we're forgetting about? In fact, there is. 
Remember earlier when I explained how the boost algorithm worked on the AM5 processors? It will boost your CPU until it hits TJ Maxx, and then it will start throttling down the boost once it hits that thermal threshold. Well, we hit that thermal threshold several times through each benchmark run. So when we look at the frequencies that the CPU ran at through those benchmark runs, you can see here on the graph that as the processor heated up, the frequency tapered down just like you would expect it to. However, if you look down at the end of the run, you'll notice that the red line stayed just a little bit higher than the blue line, indicating that the secure frame was able to control its temperature just enough to give it a little bit more boost. And it was definitely just a little bit because our average boost clock with the stock retention system was 4,683.5 megahertz. And with the secure frame retention bracket, we got an average frequency of 4,712.2 megahertz. That's an increase of 28.7 megahertz in the average. While not much, I've actually owned computers before that had a lower clock speed than that difference. So. It was a benefit. Also, you can see on this graph right here that the very beginning of the run, we had a spike that hit 4.9 gigahertz, but it only stayed there for one cycle and then dropped down to the average. You can also see that the secure frame retention bracket started at a higher frequency and ended at a higher frequency than the stock retention system as well. So before I actually sat down and crunched the numbers, I was going to tell you not to buy this thing. I was going to tell you not to buy it because it was nothing more than a way to capitalize on the benefit that the Intel retention frame performed. Because quite honestly, if you have an Intel system, you should have a retention frame for it because it absolutely makes a difference in temperatures on the Intel systems. However, this one doesn't give you the same benefit that the Intel one does. It still does give you a benefit though. In fact, I think it's a reasonable decent benefit for 15 bucks. I also believe that this thing would help even more if we had a better cooling solution on the system than the stock cooler. Because as you may have noticed with the stock cooler, we never hit our maximum boost clocks that this CPU is capable of. In fact, we averaged considerably lower than the maximum boost clock. However, that's going to change soon, so stay tuned. I'm not done trying to cool this thing down quite yet. And I also played around with Precision Boost Overdrive a little, and I was able to get closer to the maximum boost clock. However, I'm going to save that for a different video. Another thing that I wanted to touch on real quick though is that I heard while listening to other reviews of this thing when I was planning this review that one of the reviewers said that the biggest benefit to this was that it helped not make as much of a mess when using thermal paste because it's so tightly machined around the unusual shaped IHS of the AM5 processor that it helped keep the CPU a little cleaner. I thought that was the stupidest benefit until I actually started testing it and had to repeatedly go back and forth between this frame and the secure frame in repasting it every time. And I got to admit, the other reviewer was right. This thing does a lot better at keeping the mess at bay when it comes to repasting the AM5 CPU. So, for people who have spent any time at all cleaning off the thermal compound from between those little nubs on the AM5 processor, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But with that said, ultimately, I recommend using the secure bracket retention frame. Not only is it a much cleaner look than the stock retention system, but it does give a measurable performance difference. And let's be honest, $15 is one of those spontaneous Amazon buys that you order in the middle of the night when you can't sleep. In fact, I'm pretty sure that's when I bought mine. But if you really want to drop your CPU temperature, then you really should try undervolting. You can get some considerable performance and temperature gains by simply lowering your CPU's voltage. If you'd like to try that out, then check out this video here. Not only does it really work, but it's free. <laughs> I may also revisit that subject with this CPU here, so stay tuned for that. As always, you guys have a great day.